Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. This happened back while I was in college a couple years ago. Me and my roommate moved into a beautiful apartment our junior year of college. Our parents made it extremely clear that us living alone together was not ideal for some of the cheaper, shady neighborhoods close to our college. We attended a college in our state capital, so we were in a city environment, and had certain criteria we had to meet in order for us to live there, and for them to co-sign our leases. Lit sidewalks, keyed entry into the apartment building, lit parking lot, X amount of blocks from from campus, etc, etc. So we finally found one that fit our parents' criteria. Our apartment building had a keyed entry for both the front of the building and the back gate that led to the fire escape. Our apartment was an end unit that led to the fire escape, so there was two deadbolt locks on it. We loved our apartment. We felt safe, we had fun, truly living the college experience. And then my roommate's boyfriend starts slowly moving his things into the apartment and staying there way more often than he should. I finally tell my roommate if he wants to stay here and use the water, electric, and food I help pay for, then he needs to pay for it too, including our rent. I tell her a three-way split, or I'm paying only my rent and he can pay the entire electric, water, and trash bill. I think I'm being pretty fair and even though her boyfriend doesn't have a job, that's not my problem. I work and go to college, your I don't want to work at McDonald's, yes he actually said that, excuse is completely garbage. If you want a place to stay, then to the golden arches you shall go. So instead, my roommate starts sneaking him in really late at night after I go to sleep, and he leaves on days I'm home, while I'm in class he's there then leaves before I come back. My schedule is extremely routine. Well he can't have a key so if my roommate is in class or at work how is he getting in? He can't take my roommate's key because if he decides to leave halfway through the day how will she get her key back? All good questions. The solution they came up with was to leave the back door unlocked that leads to the fire escape and then he can just jump the fence at the bottom of the fire escape to get back on the fire escape when he's ready to come back or stick a rock in between the door whatever works for him. So I'm off of work in school one Thursday morning and I decide I'm going to sleep in as long as I possibly can. My roommate and her boyfriend had already left for the day so naturally they leave the door unlocked. I'm asleep and it's about 10 in the morning when I hear the back door open to the apartment. I come to just enough to recognize the noise, realize it's my neighbor or her boyfriend, and I brush it off and go try to drift back off. All of a sudden I start hearing someone creep through the apartment, wooden floors. It definitely doesn't sound like casual walking. It is clearly someone stepping slowly and quietly through the apartment. My door to my room is ajar just a sliver, but I don't see anything out the door and I'm honestly too tired to get up and look. A couple minutes pass and I figure that my roommate and or her boyfriend are just being weirdos and I fall back asleep. I can't be sure how much time passes before I open my eyes, but it can't be too long. I wake up to my door opening. My back is to the door and I am facing the opposing wall. I slowly start to turn over to see why my roommate or her boyfriend would dare wake me from my slumber, and there he is, a burglar. In my room, next to the bed I'm currently laying in, a 6 foot tall burglar, unplugging my TV about 5 feet from where I currently am. I immediately pretend I'm just shifting positions in my sleep and continue to roll over with my eyes as shut as I can make them seem, still open enough to watch what was going on. He hears me shuffling as I turn over, stops, looks dead at me, and luckily doesn't realize that my eyes are open just a tiny bit. He goes back to unplugging my TV, my DVD player, shoves it in his bag he's brought, like those bags from Ikea, and steals my change jar and casually starts walking out of the front door to my apartment, like he came in for a cup of tea or something. After I hear the door shut, I immediately spring out of bed, grab my phone, start dialing 911, all while locking the back and front doors. The dispatcher is trying to calm me down, at this point I am hysterical. I can't even catch my breath to tell her okay, luckily I told her my address before I started hyperventilating. I will take a second to commend the police department, both city and college, because they were there in less than 3 minutes. She tells me the cops are there but they need me to go downstairs to let them in the building because they don't have the key to the front door of the building. I am so afraid to open the door to my apartment and even look down the hallway. I am about to walk to the front door and extend my arm out to the handle when I hear Ma'am, it's the police. As if I didn't get scared enough already, they yell through the door. I am paranoid because the dispatcher just told me they couldn't get in and didn't realize someone probably let them in downstairs. I ask the dispatcher to confirm that the people at my door are actually police officers. She tells me that they are at my door. Okay, cool. I open the front door and I collapse right there. My legs completely turn into jello and I just
just hit the floor. I blacked out for a brief period of time, but they helped me up and sit me down on the couch. There's at least 10 officers in my apartment from both the city and college departments. When I look outside the living room window to the street below, there are 5 or 6 cop cars blocking the street. I later found out that they were doing a perimeter search around the immediate area. I'm being bombarded questions now. I have to try to find out what's missing besides the stuff from my room. I'm crying, I'm shaking, this is not at all how I saw my day off going. I tell them my roommate left the back door open for her boyfriend, they inspect the back door and blah blah. The next thing I know my roommate and her boyfriend walk in and they both have the most dumbfounded looks on both of their faces. At this point now there is a detective talking to me and I'm giving my statement. Giving a description of the burglar, the stuff missing, looking at mugshots, etc. I immediately stop talking to the detective, look up at the both of them and blurt out, someone robbed us while I was asleep, he came into my room. Two officers take her and her boyfriend aside and talk to them while I'm finishing up with the detective. I call my then boyfriend and he comes over to help me pack my stuff to stay over his house for a couple of days, which turned into staying until my lease at my place ended around four months. After failing to recognize any suspects in a lineup, the cops slowly start leaving. After they all leave, I call my parents to tell them what had happened, gather my things, and head over to my boyfriend's house. My roommate and her boyfriend never once apologized, not for leaving the door unlocked, but just a general, I'm sorry this happened to you type of apology. They never asked me if I was okay, if I wanted to talk, nothing. The day my lease ended was the best day of that entire year. I couldn't wait to get away from my roommate, her boyfriend, and that apartment. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. I didn't even care about the materialistic things. He robbed me of my safety and security and it took a good amount of counseling to get that back. I am also thankful he didn't try to attack me that morning. My friendship with my roommate was tarnished. I haven't spoken to her since. To this day, I don't sleep with my back to the door and I always have a knife under my mattress. This happened to me two to three years ago. I was around 23 at the time. I am a female and I live in Romania. One night I was coming home from class, masters. Classes start after 6 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. at around 11 p.m. I had to take the subway for about 12 stops. The destination I have to get off at was the end of the line for the subway. At the time, there wouldn't be many people in the subway. All I need is my headset and my music and I am good to go. Said and done, I plug in my music. I pick the furthest chair in the subway. I wait from the only two people that were taking the subway with me at the time. So far so good, until I see, with the corner of my eye, a silhouette approaching me and sitting right next to me. It was a man, fairly built, dark hair, wearing glasses, a black shirt with a black hoodie, and a sickening smile. He doesn't engage in talking with me, but would just stare at my phone as I would browse through my music. I can hear him breathe heavily, not like painfully, but still like he was feeling something very strong. I feel uneasy, so I decide to change my seat and go even further behind, trying to avoid him. I pick a new chair, sit down, plug my headset again, and proceed with the remaining 6 to 12 stops on my way home. I see the silhouette growing bigger and bigger and a breeze running on my skin as I realize the guy is again sitting right next to me. Glancing in midair, dead eyes, a big smile staring right into my phone. I panic, there are still 4 stops to go. I have nowhere to hide. I look after the other person in the subway trying to sit next to her, thinking that strength comes on numbers. She is no longer there. I start shaking a bit, but not allowing the creeper to notice me being vulnerable. I stand up, go to the door, and just decide to stand until my stop comes. This way he won't sit next to me, right? Wrong. He comes straight after me and sits on the chair right near the door because he couldn't see my phone, on which he was so focused so far from that angle. He fixates me right in my soul with his eyes and says, Hi gorgeous, why are you avoiding me? I am freaking out as I look at my phone trying to call my boyfriend or message him and he stops me by saying, I know no one will help you. You would have sent an SOS message by now. I know you didn't. That moment I realize I am cornered. He has been focusing on my phone to see who I was talking to, trying to figure out if I panic, trying to see if I would ask someone for help. He cornered me bad. I had the luck to reach my stop as I would delay any reaction or ignore him so that he would repeat whatever he wanted to say. I drop off and run for the exit, not looking back. I get out at the surface and I don't see him anymore. At this moment, I put my phone in my purse and realize I had pepper spray with me all along. My heartbeat comes back to normal as I know at least I have something to defend myself with, but still a long way to get home, and who knows if he is alone or not. I walk rather fast for maybe 5 minutes from the metro and feel a hand grabbing my wrist hard and pulling me back, another hand covering my mouth disabling me from screaming my lungs out. It was him, the same black hoodie, dark hair, and dead eye stalker. 
He was furious and said, how dare you run away from me? You should be honored I give you attention. Now, my phone is in my bag, I can't call the police, and I can't reach for the pepper spray. I panic, I can't punch him in the crotch, his hand is still on my mouth. What do I do? I did the most desperate and disgusting thing I could think of just to save my life. I played along. I used my other hand to touch the inside of his thigh and mumble a I'm sorry while his hand was on my mouth. He took his hand off my mouth and repeated that I'm sorry, I didn't realize he was just flirting. He let his guard down and took his hand off my wrist. He asked me for my phone number and address to drop me off, but I refused saying I'd rather add him on Facebook and he agreed. I told him I'd reach for my phone but instead picked the pepper spray and got him sprayed all over his face. He made sure I'd cover both his eyes, nose, mouth, even his ears and hands. He instantly got all red, suffocating from the pepper and swelling. I called the police, told them what had happened and what I did. They asked me if he is immobilized and I said yes as the effect wears off in 45 minutes. The police arrived there 5 minutes later to see me shaking like a leaf and a man on the ground, swollen like a pumpkin, throwing up and swearing me between gasps of breath. He was arrested and the police told me they had been looking for him for the past week as they discovered the body of a 24 year old woman in his apartment. A lady with red hair. I have red hair too. The woman was his girlfriend and ever since he's never gotten back to the apartment. I do not know what he wanted to do with me. I can understand why he targeted me due to the similarities but I just hope I don't ever have to meet him again. I used to live in a townhouse, duplex, by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally, I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda, but none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out for a last pee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulb so I always took him out the front. That night, it was around 11pm and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside of a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was trying to steal some stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gave me the absolute creep so I grab my dog and go inside. I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch at my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. And like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment. And then he is there. He's not just there, he has stopped at the top of my driveway. Just standing there. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance. Like he was preparing for something. Like he wanted to come kill me. My heart is racing so hard I can barely hear. And I'm standing there slack jawed looking at this would be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window further opening it and I see this person, this man looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He starts walking down my driveway undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go sit in my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my dad who lives in a suburb away. He answers. I whispered to him what was happening and he said he will be there as soon as he can. I lie down on my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks, pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in, what if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me, why am I lying here in the dark crying, turn a light on, so I did. What well, seemed like a lifetime but was probably just a couple minutes later my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia so no guns but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. I called the police who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have, I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted but for a good year after that I was scared living there. Luckily that feeling faded away after a while.
This happened to me a few years back when I was in my early 20s. At the time, I worked in a department store and a makeup counter. The job relies heavily on good customer service and building relationships because you want people to keep coming back to spend money on your products. We are given personalized business cards so that we can build up our own client base. Very important for a commission department. It's not uncommon to be familiar with the people who frequently shop in the store. As workers, our training is focused on being friendly and accommodating. One day while I was working, I had to move to a makeup counter that wasn't my own to cover someone's lunch break. It was a really slow day so I was just leaning on the counter, people watching. I could tell most shoppers were just browsing so I kept to myself. One of the people that I noticed was a very tall and broad man. He walked very slowly, almost hunched over. His face was fixed very aggressively, like he was angry but focused. He circled around the counter a few times but I could feel his gaze on me instead of the products. After a few rotations around the department, I decided to greet him in case he needed help. It wasn't until he came directly over me that I realized just how big he actually was. I'm a 4 foot 10 female, so I feel pretty small regardless. But even with his slouched posture, he was over 6 feet tall and well over twice my weight. I'll never forget his teeth, they were completely black in the front. Your eyes couldn't help but go right to them. Despite his menacing appearance, he was soft spoken. Truthfully, I could tell he wasn't all there by the way he talked. He told me no when I asked if he needed help, but requested my number, so direct. We had never spoken before. I declined and said that I was in a relationship and that it would be inappropriate. He then asked if he could have a business car for the counter in case he wanted to get products. Since I wasn't on my normal counter and I really wanted him to go away, I handed him my coworker's business card and told him to call if he had any questions. It worked and he walked away after that, filling me with relief. Only a couple minutes later the phone on the counter rings. I answer with my peppy customer service voice and say, thank you for calling makeup brand name, how can I help you? And immediately I know it is the same guy when he starts talking. He asks me again for my personal number and I explain once again that I cannot do that. But he just wants to talk, he explains. Since he wasn't getting the hint, I say, I should have told you that I'm married, you can't have my number. Politely he apologizes and hangs up. I thought that would be the end of him, but for the next few weeks or so I spent much of my time at work anxious that he he would show up. I would see him every week and he would lurk around the counter looking for me. Anytime I would see him, I'd immediately drop what I was going to to run and hide or run to the closest customer and offer any bit of assistance to make it look like I was busy so he wouldn't talk to me. I successfully dodged him every time and it came to the point where I stopped seeing him. I was thrilled. I had almost completely forgotten about him until one day I decided to go to Walmart by myself to pick up a few things on my day off. I generally like to shop alone. I can take all the time I need and I like leisurely looking around. I grabbed a basket and made my way over to the cosmetic slash hair wellness section since that's where most of the things I needed were. I only managed to grab a few things before I locked eyes with them as I walked by the supplement aisle. I had recently changed my hair color and wasn't wearing my work uniform so I didn't think he'd realize who I was. I was ready to just go about my shopping and ignore him until I noticed that he dropped the items he had in his hand and started heading my way. I panicked and swiftened my pace immediately. I thought to myself, he's not going to really follow you through the store right, but as I turned around to look I could see his humongous body just plowing through people, with that same terrifying look on his face, only meaner, his black teeth growing closer with a snarl. Since the direction I was walking was the opposite of the exit and there was no way I was going to turn around, I decided that my best course of action would be to follow the perimeter of the store and cut down the center section, which would bring me close to the registers. I speed walked the entire time in the hopes of losing him amongst all the people, but never once turning around again. By the time I made it to the register area, I could actually feel him behind me. Still not wanting to turn around to look, I glanced in the reflection of the soda machines that are in between the register aisles to see how close he was. To my horror, there was only about two feet between us. I was afraid to just drop my stuff and run out the door in case he followed me to my car. I had parked in the far back of the parking lot and didn't want to risk it. I also didn't want to get in line at the registers since the lines were long and I would just be standing out in the open alone. Instead, I walked into the cluster of people crowded around the cell self-checkout line. I noticed another large but older gentleman with his carriage in the middle and ran straight for him. The people were so closely clustered together that the man following me couldn't make it through. I ran over to the man in line and grabbed onto his carriage. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not cutting you, but there's a man that's been following me through half the store and I need to stand with you. He was so sweet and let me be with him while we waited in line and even let me go ahead of him so I could leave quicker. As I was cashing out, I could see in my peripheral vision my stalker staring at me and pacing about, but he couldn't come near me since the self-checkout is somewhat sectioned off. 
By the time I had finished and grabbed my receipt, I couldn't see him anymore. I looked around but he was nowhere. I thought about asking the older man to walk me to my car, but he still wasn't finished at his register, so I decided to call my boyfriend and make a run for it. Staying on the phone, I explained to him what was going on as I sprinted to my car, frantically looking around in case he tried to follow me outside. I made it to my car safely and rushed right home, breaking down to my parents about what just happened. I could feel it in my bones that the man wanted to do something to me, and thankfully I didn't find out what that was. His aggressive aura was bad. To this day, I could still remember the adrenaline that I felt when he followed me. I had never felt so vulnerable. I quit that job roughly two years later. This incident happened in the summer of 2015. I lived by myself in a nice house inside a small town. Low crime, but still the occasional shady person. Anyway, at work that day on a smoke break, I watched a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle, four lane city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there, scooped his little self up, and booked it back to my workplace. He was not injured, amazingly. As a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me until I could figure out what to do with him. I have a large amount of cats, and always have. This was my first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy, head hung, tail tucked, jumpy, just looking at me like I was about to beat him. I was clueless on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew that they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out about 15 times, as I did not want him using the bathroom in my house, obviously. I was having my final cigarette of the day on my porch. The dog was on a lead, chilling under my chair as I smoked and chilled. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs by my house. He kept glancing up at me before passing. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on his heel, and approached. Hey, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him I would search the address on my phone, which, of course, was taking a minute to pull up. He explained he didn't have a phone of his own and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps toward me the whole time. Finally, the address I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in the direction. He kept his eyes locked on me, continuing to slowly move closer. The dog starts growling very softly at this point. I forgot he was even there until now. Mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm bad with directions. I rose from my seat, pointing again. It's truly just two blocks up the road. Just follow the road. Two blocks. The house will be on your left, making it very clear that I wasn't going to just hand him my phone. Well, can I call them? I need to let them know I'm coming, he said, still creeping closer, extending his hand. No, I curtly replied. How about text them, pushing forward still? Dude, no. I started toward my door. Just let me see your phone. He was visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it and getting way too close to my porch. As a last ditch effort of getting this dude to screw off, I say, you need to get out of my yard. My dog's protective. He will screw you up. I didn't know the first thing about this dog, let him know whether he had the capacity to screw someone up. I just hoped Sane would intimidate pushy phone guy. Like I had said the magic words, Pupper springs into action. The dog emerges like a bullet from under the chair, growling, snarling, and barking his head off. He jerks me near off the porch trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like an 80 pound attack dog, not a 40 pound timid beagle mix. I was afraid. I didn't know if the pup would turn on me. As stated previously, at the time I knew absolutely jack nothing about dogs. He backed his hindquarters into my legs, almost nudging me to the door, still carrying on, eyes locked on phone dude and baring his teeth. Phone dude holds up his hands and backs off, stammers something like, uh, two blocks north, yeah, and begins walking that way. I go inside, cut off my lights and peek out the window at him. He glances at my house, assured I'm inside, turns and begins walking the completely opposite direction I pointed him in. Icing on the cake, he pulls a phone from his pocket and raises it to his ear to make a call. The dog secured his place as a member of the family that night. He is incredibly protective of me and has frightened away another creeper since this incident. He is attached at my hip and has made it know that he is grateful to be in a safe, loving home, wherein he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. His name is Hank, and I truly believe that night would have ended very poorly for me had he not been there. So about three years ago, I was going to school in a US city and was living with two other roommates. My one roommate was known to usually bring CD characters back to the apartment. At one point during our fall semester, she befriended a guy in her advertising class who went by the name of Dallas. He became her weed dealer and she would frequently bring him over to the apartment. I suspected they were sleeping together, but she denied it. It was a strange relationship, but who am I to judge? My other roommate and I thought he was charismatic enough, but also didn't see the appeal that Christy, my 
my roommate who befriended him, Saul. I remember one night we had Dallas over for dinner. He told us how he played for our college's football team, that he just started his own business at the age of 25, and how he was a very well-known weed dealer who made a lot of money, and his name was Dallas because he used to live in Dallas, Texas, and his parents named him after that. Me and my other roommate nodded our heads and listened, but we didn't think much of it except for this dude thought he was hot stuff and wanted to glow about himself. I believe he came over for dinner or something maybe one or two other times. My roommate claimed that one time she decided to buy weed from him and went to his apartment off campus. When she arrived, she saw our roommate, Christy, just passed out on a chair in the middle of the day in Dallas's apartment in some random room. When my roommate arrived, he mentioned nothing of her being there. My roommate shook her awake and Christy just woke up in a haze and basically told my roommate to screw off. My roommate recounted the story to me and we both agreed it was weird and Dallas was probably not the safest person to hang with. After a couple of months, Christy stopped hanging with him. I remember remember her saying he got pissed she didn't want to sleep with him. I also found out that a friend of hers, who knew him for a long time, was engaged to him. Oh also, his real name wasn't Dallas. Yeah, real shocker there. Fast forward two years. Me nor my roommate talk to Christy anymore. We are living elsewhere in said city, doing our own thing. We get an alert on our phones that a girl who had just transferred to our college went missing after leaving from one of the campus bars the previous night. It doesn't take long, maybe a few days when this huge story breaks. This girl was killed by someone she left the bar with that night. My roommate calls me and goes, do you remember what Dallas's real name was? I go, yeah, I believe it was said name. She goes, go online and read this article. He killed that girl who just went missing. Sure enough, I go online and there's the most horrifying mugshot of Dallas with a photo of the girl he had just slain. It gets crazier. Apparently, he had taken her home that night and attempted a one-night stand and he killed her by blunt force and strangulation. If that isn't terrible enough, he cleaned up the evidence-ish in his apartment, threw her body in a storage container, took a lift to his grandma house hours away and bury the storage container with her remains in it on the property somewhere. After obtaining a video of the two of them leaving together from the bar, it didn't take cops long to bust him. Weeks after the story broke, so many girls came forward and shared similar creepy stories about Dallas. The guy who played for State College's football and ran a successful business. You can guess that none of this was ever true. Also, he was like 28 years old, claiming he was still a student at Aber College when this happened, prying on younger women. I just hope he rots in prison for the rest of his life. For a bit of backstory, my mom was dating an abusive guy at the time. We'll call him Ian. Because of Ian and the crazy fights they had gotten into, we couldn't lock up my house at all. He had kicked in both the front and the back door to the house and they never fixed. My mother and Ian were at the bar all day, every day. I told you this so you would know why the house wasn't locked up and where my parents were when this happened. This incident occurred when I was around 12 years old and my little brother around 10. I was a really small girl at this age and my brother was sick all the time so he was very tiny and frail. My mother and Ian were at the bar as usual. When you opened my front door, it put you in the living room and you could see the back door. There was a hallway to the right that led back into the bedrooms, and that is where my brother and I were. We were in his bedroom with the door closed playing something on a PlayStation. It was around midnight or 1am and we were playing and having a good time when I heard a weird noise. My brother didn't hear it and I didn't want to creep him out. I told him that I wanted to go get a drink and told him to stay in the room and I would bring him something. To get to my kitchen, you would have to walk down the hallway in front of both the front and back door because it was behind the living room. I kept hearing strange noises so before I left out of my brother's room, I told him to get into the closet and work on our fort so that it would be ready when I was done getting our drinks and a snack. I raised my little brother for the most part and took care of him. I had a terrible feeling, a sense of dread. I could tell something wasn't right and this was a way to get my brother to hide without scaring him. He frightened easily and had really bad asthma attacks and at this time we had no inhaler or his breathing treatment machine for for him. I knew if he started having an asthma attack on top of being scared, it wouldn't be pretty. Anyway, I left the back room and decided to see what was going on. I started sneaking up the hallway as slowly and quietly as I could. I was terrified. I could feel that something was wrong. Before I made it to the end of the hallway, I hear a man. It sounded like he was grunting. I can't explain it, but the feeling that washed over me made me near puke. So I of course freeze. I have no one in this town. I don't know anyone and my dad is living in a different state. My mom is at the bar drunk. I was sitting there trying to gather the courage to see what was around the corner and going over 
are my options when I hear my brother's door open. He sees me and the look on my face and freezes. I remember his eyes going so wide with fear because he must have heard the grunting too. I motion him with my hands to go back in the room and he does. I gathered the courage to peek around the corner and what I saw still freaks me out to this day. It was horrifying. I saw a man, probably around 6 foot 2, sitting on my couch with a grin on his face. By some stupid luck that man didn't see me. I slowly snuck back to my brother's room. I slowly shut the door and started going over my options. My little brother was already horrified because of the grunting noise this man was making. I am so thankful he wasn't the one who saw what was out there. I gathered myself and calmly told him that there was a man that I didn't know on the couch and he needed to be very quiet and I needed him to be brave and keep his breathing in check. My little brother adored me and looked up to me so when I told him that I needed him to be brave, he tried his best. I told him not to move and he didn't. The first thing I tried was the window, but it wouldn't budge. It was completely stuck. I'm making myself stay calm for my brother's sake, but I know what's sitting out there. So since the window was stuck, I decided to start looking for a weapon. My oldest brother lived here and I knew he had swords somewhere. I don't remember where he was. As I'm looking for a weapon, I hear the man saying, I know you're here. My stomach nodded up. The hair on the back of my neck raised and I instantly got a cold sweat. And then I hear it. My little brother had started wheezing. Asthma attack. I hugged him, reminded him about being brave and told him to sit still and focus on his breathing. I started frantically trying to get my window open, but it was stuck. I looked around and started moving blankets when I find my older brother's cell phone that he always forgot. I remember thinking that I was lucky and felt a bit of relief. I immediately called the police and told them what was going on, hysterical at this point but still remaining quiet. The dispatcher told me to remain on the phone so she could hear what was happening when the man started banging on our bedroom door. It had been about 5 minutes into the phone call when this happened and I could no longer remain calm. I had lost it. I started screaming. I forgot to mention that our bedroom had the only working lock, so the door was locked. He was trying to get in and banging on the door. His banging got louder and louder. He was screaming to let him in when it went completely silent. Then he did the creepiest, most terrifying thing ever. He started laughing. He then says, you know I could just bust down this door in about two seconds, right little girl? He then starts lightly knocking on the door and asking me to open it. Then I hear the police start screaming at him to get on the ground, put his hands up, etc. I heard him putting up a fight, followed by more yelling and eventually silence. After a few minutes, there was a knock on my door, but at this point, I was too terrified to open it. I thought that this nightmare guy was still there. So being in my hysterical state, I started screaming, no, 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 please, over and over again, sobbing and shaking. I couldn't stay brave for my little brother anymore. I was on the floor holding him this whole time, convinced we were going to die. Eventually, I calmed myself a bit, and this time a female officer was at the door, so I opened it. There were about five cops standing in the hallway listening to me being hysterical. I refused to let go of my brother at this point, but we both ran to this female officer and just collapsed, sobbing hysterically. We had been so scared. It turns out this guy was completely wasted and high on drugs. I remember the cops walking me up to him and having me stand in front of him to ask me if I knew this man. I didn't. The man's eyes were completely bloodshot and filled with hatred. My parents were called and investigated for leaving us alone like that and for the doors being like that. My mom is a different person now, doesn't drink and is now married to a cop. She completely changed. I remember asking her about it later on and she told me something that I didn't know. The man had a huge knife, so that's what he was scraping the door with. He also had some rope, tape, and a tarp. I still don't know how he didn't get to us, or why he didn't just bust the door down to get us. It would have taken one half kick from him to kick the door down. It was super thin. So hopefully I will never have to endure that horrible experience again. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me. A few days later, it happened again, but this time, she was following me. I assumed she wasn't following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she did not follow me up to my building. After a while, I noticed we took the same train home. A lot of the time, she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she'd look away. Then, she'd continue looking when she thought I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office. I went there for lunch a couple times during the week. I started seeing the girl sitting in the window for lunch and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was almost always there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes, she would walk the same way as me. Once I got to my place, 
place. I live in a condo with my brother. She would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed was spam. There would either be silence on the other end or the person would hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people I already knew or were already on my friends list. December of 2017 comes. By this time, I'm not going to Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue, said she wanted to follow me on Instagram. We text a couple of times and I accept her follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. I'm talking about every day slash every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this when she asks me if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal should have sent red flags up for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like what would you do when you're trying to get to know someone. She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself, and I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things I do, but that's it. August 2018 rolls around. I am still seeing creepy girl everywhere during the week. I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking back about them. Now, I never post on Facebook and would never talk bad about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with anyone, nor do I know of anyone who has a problem with me. I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently and I tell her what happened a couple days later when I got home from work. I tell her I don't want to get much into it, but she keeps pushing for details. I finally told her I was going to go to bed and she got the message. The more I thought about all the time she texted me, the more uneasy I got. So some things that she said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remembered her. We had kept in touch over the years, just not as frequently and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram but the Instagram she last messaged me through wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was. Phone number is completely different and it turns out that she was never the one texting me nor did she request following me on Instagram. I track the number and it turns out to be one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain it was the girl that's been following me. These things only started after she appeared. The phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook requests, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think much to it. This whole ordeal is really scary when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and my address at one point. My friend even confirmed a post my brother made with pictures he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for 8 months about my life and they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. She doesn't follow me anymore, but when she did see me on the metro, she would always sit somewhere that she was able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number. I just hope that she decided to forget me and move on. About 5 or so years ago, I was 23 at the time and had just gotten out of my first and only serious relationship a year prior. That guy was my first love so needless to say when things ended and he had zero interest in trying to work things out, I was heartbroken. After about a year of moping around, I decided to try actual dating. I met this guy Rick on a dating website. He was a couple of years older than me, was an ex-marine, and good at making conversation. After a few days of talking online, he asked for my number and we decided to meet up. I drove to his house and come to find out he lived with a few other guys who looked really shady. Now he actually lived in a good neighborhood, but the way they kept their home and the way his roommates looked was my first red flag that a inexperienced and naive girl would not fit in his crowd but I decided to stay and give it a chance. Once he saw me, he came up, gave me a hug, and handed me a helmet to his motorcycle. Now I have never in my life rode a motorcycle before but I had always wanted to, so I thought why not and hopped on. Now the street he decides to take me up is known to be a very long and windy road that is pretty 
secluded. It's also important to note that this is the springtime and it's about 5pm when we go on our ride. I didn't realize at the time he had decided to take me on that specific road, but once we got on it, my red flag started to kick in. I began to realize that, one, it is dead silent and there are no other cars on this road right now, two, it started to get dark, and three, yeah, I don't know this guy so what am I doing, and my alarm bells start ringing. Once my anxiety kicked in, I told him that I think we should turn around and go home. He started laughing and asked if I was scared and I said no, I just need to head home because my parents are expecting me for dinner soon. He kept riding forward. More alarm bells ringing. Pictures of me lying dead in a ditch came up. I kept asking can we please turn back and he finally gave in and turned around. The next day comes and I told myself that maybe I was just overreacting and he was harmless and decided to agree on a second date a few days later. We met up at a sports bar for dinner and a couple of beers so we can watch the hockey game. The entire time we were sitting there, Rick has his arm around me and has me literally attached to his hip, constantly trying to make out with me and is acting extremely possessive. At this point I'm completely freaked out because I barely know this guy and all he is talking to me about is our future and how he would be such a protected boyfriend because he was an ex-marine. At this point, I knew I was done with him, but unfortunately, my car is at his house. When we are done and head home, he insists that I come inside and hang out for a bit. I decide to walk in and stay for 5 minutes. We walk into his room and he immediately pounces on me, making out with me and trying to feel me up. I kept pushing his hands away and kept telling him that I needed to get going, but I could tell he wasn't going to give up until he got what he wanted, especially after I realized his little friend was aroused. He told me that he would not let me leave until we did something. I said screw this and was able to bolt out of his door and sped home. After that night, he tried to ask me to hang out again and I told him that I think it would be best if we stayed friends. This guy began to relentlessly call me and text me and beg me to see him, then proceeded to call me names because I was ignoring him, then would apologize for calling me said names and it was because he liked me so much, so I blocked him. Then he tried to message me on Instagram, so I blocked him on there, and then on Facebook, and finally on Snapchat. I never gave Rick any more attention and moved on. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story happened to me about 6 months ago. I have lived where I lived for 3 years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the late 90s. In the last few years, the city I live in has had a massive population boom and people have been non-stop pouring in, good weather, amazing economy, cool place to do stuff always. Because of this, I have seen the landlord staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date to attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like 6 years before he he ended up buying a house and moved. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is that there are two stories. Where my bedroom is, on the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase in my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up against the wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling to. For weeks I would always see the workers over there painting and redoing the floors, etc. A few days before this happened was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance in the kitchen and when I came home from work, they were gone for the day. Nothing unusual for a single bit. The part that is unusual though is what happened one particular night. I was awake around 1am watching TV in my room when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up the stairs, and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall. I could feel him listening to me breathing. I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. I heard nothing for a few minutes, and then after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person start walking the rest of the stairs to the second floor. It was very obvious that someone was on the other side of that wall listening to me. I also knew that it was only a few days before this happened that I saw the maintenance redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew that there was no way someone already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all, nothing. I went back into my room and laid down in bed again. I didn't play the TV, I just sat there waiting to hear something again. I was messing around on my phone for around 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement in the stairs again. This time though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I was sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall listening to my every move. 
This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched out the window again. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building in the apartment. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building and the apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after could hear him talking to someone but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I went downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop that it was a heck of a way to meet your new neighbor. I felt embarrassed, but more importantly felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed off the whole thing as it just being late and my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day I went to leave my apartment when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps towards my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment and I looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on, and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked over to a maintenance man and said, didn't someone move in here? And he informed me no and that the apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone is staying there and she said absolutely not. I told her about what I experienced the night before. She was floored. She told me that they would change that apartment's locks immediately. She also suggested that I call the non-emergency line to the police department and inform them that no one lives there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information and detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out what officer came out to check out the situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed that I had never seen him around the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it and started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in and they are very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went out to introduce myself to them. But to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping the following weeks of that happening to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I have zero idea of what the intentions were of the person or what they were doing on that staircase. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of the story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida and lived with my family in my hometown in the Florida Panhandle. It's about a 7 hour drive up through Central Florida to get between the two places, so I mostly only went home for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving in my junior year, and I was excited that I had managed to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic and was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have a last meal together before we all left for break. So I ate in the campus dining hall around 4 p.m. and I set off on my journey around 5.30 p.m. Around 10 p.m. I had just passed my two-third mark, where I always stopped at this little mom and pops type of diner by the side of the highway to grab a snack, use the restroom, and call my dad to let him know I was okay. I didn't have a cell phone yet. Well, I hadn't been there since summer and the place was out of business, so a little bummed out that I wasn't getting my chocolate chip pancakes. I just kept going. There really wasn't much built up around there at the time, so when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all the places on this green earth, some town called Alachua, so I went for it. So I went and parked directly under the street light for safety and used the facilities, call my dad, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman who approached me asking for directions, saying she was with her husband and two small children from Virginia and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, gray or bluish work van parked very close to the driver's side of my 95 Honda Civic. Yeah, okay, I thought that's pretty weird. It had Florida tags on it, so it couldn't have been the ladies I talked to in the bathroom. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop 
promptly running into some random middle-aged guy with two little boys. Getting to talk to him, it turned out it was his wife I had spoken to as she emerged from the bathroom a second later, and I felt comfortable speaking to him. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said he'd go check it out, so he left the kids with his wife and strutted up to the driver's side of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking, his voice awkwardly quivered, but we could hear him yell it from where we were standing some 100 feet away. Excuse me gentlemen, we already called the police so I'm gonna have to politely suggest that you get out of here. And then he ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, pointed to me with a swift you and said come on let's all get in the car now and we ran together. So here I was, confusedly sitting in the back of the stranger's SUV while he went and used the payphone to presumably call the police. Meanwhile, the van peeled out of there. Like, I have never seen someone get out of there quite like they got out of there. They ran up on the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van and he could see in it pretty well because I had parked under the street light. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was a guy sitting in the driver's seat and a guy sitting in the back. A tarp laid out in the back and a bunch of other random items back there he couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the guys were reading a newspaper or a map or anything. They were apparently both just sitting there. I'd say I was around 8 at the time this took place. At the time, we had to get mail from the post office in town, and so seeing my mom get the mail, my brain decided, wow, I want to be cool and get the mail like mom. That childish need to prove that I was mature. Eventually, after time and time of begging, my mom let me get the mail. I'd guess it was a weekend as the post office was closed, but you could still grab mail, just no people that worked there were there. I asked my mom if I could grab the mail as we slowly pulled up outside the post office. She nodded and gave me the keys that had the mail key and a few others. I jumped out of the old van and ran up the ramp to the building, avoiding the stairs completely. I opened the door and saw a lady and a man getting their mail, but turning to my side, I saw an older man sitting in the corner staring at me. He gave me weird vibes even as a kid, but still I gave him a quick smile and wave. Bad move. The man smiled back, revealing his stained teeth. I walked past him and went to the mailbox. Me being me though, I forgot what key was what and began fumbling awkwardly as the others grabbing mail left the building. After maybe 3-5 to five minutes of trying and failing, I finally unlocked it. I was so happy that I disregarded the man staring as I grabbed the mail. With a quick click of the lock, I closed the box and began to walk away. I found the gaze of the man as he looked at me, a crooked smile across his face. I put my open hand against the door and began to push when a pair of arms reached around me, one hand forcefully pulling the door shut and the other around the upper part of my chest, like my collarbone, pulling me into a tight, unwelcome and horrible hug. I froze. What was I supposed to do? I was always taught to respect adults and I did. He had a strong scent of alcohol on him, so much I think I coughed a few times. He began to speak after a moment of just holding me there. The words he spoke scared me really bad. He then said, Man, hey, where are you going? He spoke, almost passive aggressively. Me, oh, I have to go. My mom was waiting for me. Man, oh, okay. He sounded defeated and began to let me go. Before I could break away, he held me tighter again, tighter than before. Wait, wait, wait. I have a dog you know, he had a grin on his face. Me, oh that's cool. Man, yeah, and you should come with me and you can play with him. I almost went with him at that moment, but luckily something told me not to. The next maybe 8 minutes he had let me go and pulled me back hard into him, his dirty coat brushing against me. He kept telling me to go with him. Finally, he seemed to snap. Man, alright, you're coming with me. Me, what? But I need my mom. I have her keys and she's waiting for me, please. That was still my priority, her keys and mail. Man, nope, you're coming with me now. He opened the door and began to pull me out. In a moment of his weakness, I broke away, running to my mom in her car. I slammed the door shut, scaring my brother and my mother. I began shaking and crying, dropping the mail on the car floor. I picked it up and handed everything to my mom as she demanded to know what happened. I told her everything and she looked pissed. I was so glad that she was on my side. I looked outside, tears still streaming down my face, and noticed the man look at me through the car window from the top ramp of the building. I began to cry harder and panic as he started coming over. My mom stopped me as she noticed him coming. He fell at the bottom of the ramp and tripped. My mom laughed at the creep and started driving away, while she tried to comfort me saying things like, he was a harmless old drunk man and he didn't hurt you. I'm pretty sure I knew what his intentions were towards my younger self, and I'm just glad that I was able to get away from the man.
This happened in 2015 when I was 16 and still living in my hometown. A forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things you can do there as a teenager. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of fun park type things, only a whole lot worse. There's a crappy arcade with broken skee-ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s, a pathetic mini golf course, and the most dangerous go-karts you've probably ever seen in your life. Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down is the beach, and across the single street are woods. If our town is in the middle of nowhere, Miller's is practically on the moon. My cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-karting. It was around 10pm, so we knew it'd be almost deserted, but that was the way we liked it. I picked her up from her house and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty parking lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever. There was no one there except for a few boys in the arcade and a guy who looked to be in his 60s sitting on a bench near the batting cages. Emma and I paid him no mind and went to the go-kart track. Like I said, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced way too fast around the windy track. This is why I didn't notice the guy walking over to the fence and why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence, right where I parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression, a weird smile with dark eyes. I managed an uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, who was obviously higher than a kite, and Emma and I went off again. This time I couldn't focus. The dude gave me the worst type of feeling. My eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was we only had bought three tickets. We were on our second to last run and he was standing directly next to the exit gate. I was just praying that he'd move before we were done. But of course, no such luck. Our last go came and went, and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt, and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was, but she didn't seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening. I opened the gate, and the guy stepped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry and he smelled of cigarettes. What are you girls doing all alone here? My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what? She said, pushing past the gate so she stood beside me. It's so late. His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake. Do your parents know that you're out? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. This was a lie and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had. Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you to your car? He starts inching towards me and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb as we're both small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us are anywhere near his size. This guy clears six foot too easy, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we were just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us here. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town, and I knew that she knew this. The guy's face immediately changes. His smile disappeared, and he now was glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself start to cower. Boyfriend, he says roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left, and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, it felt safer than outside. We ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What do we do? I left my phone in my car. I whisper shouted. There was no way I was going out there alone, and the go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack. I don't have mine either. I left it charging, she said, face palming. We're just gonna have to make a run for it. Are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. What about the the guy who runs the go-karts. We could get him to walk us out, she said. I just shook my head. He's as high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Then we have no choice. She stood up pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard, wanting to cry. I'd never been that scared before. There was something so wrong about that guy. We made our way out of the arcade, looking around to see if he's nearby. The park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drive me to the exit. I was looking every direction every second, waiting for the guy to come out, out of the woods or something something and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. Everything was still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed, and I pulled them from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when I stopped dead in my tracks. What, she whispered. I stared at the car, 
keys in hand. I had never locked it. I never locked the car, Emma. What? I didn't lock it. What if? I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car, and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled me away. I'm just going to peek. If I say run, you run. Her voice is quiet. I nodded shakily. She eventually made it close enough to see inside, but by the way she was squinting, I knew it was too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if he's in there? All these thoughts. Almost drown out. The unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement. My head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at us at full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized I had locked it. Emma was already on the other side, screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door, flung it open, and practically threw myself inside. I just managed to close the door when he was there, slamming his fist against the window and shouting incoherently. I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it as hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go, and through my tears I shoved the key into the ignition and flew into reverse. He was still chasing us and yelling as I veered backwards out of the lot and turned as fast as I could while slamming on the gas. I was driving like I was still in a go-kart, but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears, and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I regained some composure. Though obviously shaken up, she managed to keep her tears and be the same one out of the two of us as we drove at least 30 miles over the speed limit the whole way back to my house. We kept this encounter a secret between us for a long time, but me and Emma decided to tell this encounter we had experienced on here. We didn't talk about it until months after the horrifying encounter. Safe to say we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that. I urge all of you to be extremely careful when going out at night. I just hope that me and Emma never have to see that lunatic again. This story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972 when she was 8 years old. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant slash gas station in our hometown. They have always run a business of some type since the 50s. This means that a lot of days my mom would take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, usually no more than an hour or two. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her, but he was a little older and sometimes had football practice. So was the case in the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day, let herself in the house, and put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy and knew the first thing she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog in a white towel, this is important, and walked him outside. As she put down the dog, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flailing it about the wind. It's then she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street. This guy was in his late 20s and was known to be very strange. My mom said he always creeped her and everyone else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside and made her feel generally uncomfortable. She said he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day and as she took out the blanket he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little shook, she picked up her pup, went inside and locked the door. She began to do some homework and after about 5 minutes of work, she heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked to the window to see who it was. She knew it wasn't my grandparents because of course they had keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street, like he was already looking in the window. She jumped and said she screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She walked to the door and made sure it was locked. She said he just continued with the slow continuous thud on the door, almost in rhythm. Knock, knock, knock. Then she really got terrified as he began speaking to her through the door. Hi sweetie, I saw you with your doggy. Let me in to see him. She was in shock. Come on and let me in sweetie, please. I want to see your puppy. In full freak out mode, my mom screamed. You need to leave now. You need to go back to your house. I don't know you. He kept knocking. Knock, knock, knock knock. I can see the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part. He said, let me in, I saw you waving your flag of surrender. I kid you not, the guy thought my mom shaking hair from the blanket was a flag of surrender and a sign for him to come over. My mom screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off her fear. She then got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house so the kitchen and the rec room were down there along with the only phone in the house. She made it to the phone and began to dial 9 one. All of a sudden, she heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through and my mother screamed what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him as his lower half couldn't squeeze through. Then my mom began hearing my grandmother's screams, what are you doing? 
Then the guy yelling in pain and screaming out the window as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in her garden on the side of the house where the entrance to the window was. He managed to get out the window and bolted to his house. The police came, grandma called my grandfather and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested him for breaking and entering. On the day of his court date he told them the white flag of surrender story but this was the final nut on his crazy cake as they put him in a mental institution that day. He may have gotten out but went back because my mother said he later died in an institution. Outside the courthouse, the crazy family of the creep tried to blame my 8 year old mother and the man's father called my mother a harlot. We always can't help but wonder though, what would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that moment? This took place when I was about 16. My aunt was in town visiting and we were coming back from the grocery store. We were driving back to my mom's house, my parents are divorced, and she lived way out in the country. Like, it's a 10 minute drive from anywhere. We pull up at our driveway and a red car pulls in behind us. My aunt and I stay in the car and the man approaches the driver's side door. I can't rightly tell you why he looked like a creep, but he looked like a creep. Very pasty skin, eyes that were staring down too hard, just overall weird. He claims he is lost and looking for his way to a fitness center in the town next over. The exact fitness center that is about a minute away from where the grocery store is, i.e. the opposite direction of where we just came from. Super odd, but I give him directions. He thanks me, but continues to stare at me. He asks if we know each other and I reply no. He gives me his name and I again repeat no, I do not. A couple of seconds of awkward staring and he asks me what my name is. Well, being an idiot and feeling anxious, I tell him that was a mistake. He confirms we don't know each other, oh really, and heads back to his car and we watch him leave. My aunt and I agree he was very strange but shake it off and take the groceries in. From where we were parked, you have to take a little windy path up behind the house to the back door. My aunt goes outside to grab the rest of the groceries and I settle on the couch in the living room and look outside. Red car in the driveway. My aunt comes upstairs and said the guy was almost to our door and claimed he forgot the directions. My aunt curtly told him right, left, right and told him to leave. The directions were truly that simple when following the main roads. I'm freaked, she's freaked but we never see him again. A month passes and I'm chilling at my dad's and posted something like, I'm bored at my dad's house, who wants to chill on Facebook? Guys, always set your page to private. Several minutes later, I get a message from the same guy asking if I wanted him to come over. I'm home alone and understandably terrified. I immediately block him and tell my dad, who goes to one of his cop friends to see if they know anything about this guy. Well, this man was kicked out of a local university for stalking, and had two other counts of stalking on top of that and a restraining order. Another month goes goes by and I'm in study hall with a friend and he is telling me about this guy who was stalking his older sister. I don't remember the specific details, but it was definitely the story of someone being stalked. The craziest part was the stalker almost drove this girl's brother off the road in an attempt to get him to pull over. Once pulled over, stalker jumped out and was making his way to my friend's vehicle when my friend noped right out of there. I'm sure you guessed it, but the stalker and the creep I ran into were the same person. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy, religious town was not my ideal place. Eventually, I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out almost every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time we were hanging out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the stuff he said was just the drugs talking. But one day he said, I'm gonna stab someone this week. For Four days later, he threatened to shoot up a place on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, Students would run from him in the hallways, people were sending him threats, his reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed, he was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something and he would start attacking me with words. If I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship and for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this, the verbal abuse continued and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off of Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex, not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone that wasn't him. Alex was also a weed dealer and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact 
exact amount of weed, but it was a decent amount, enough to be mad about if you don't get paid for it. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off, and called 911, calling it a drug deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house, who lives in Sean's neighborhood, when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled out his window and called him a coward, then drove away. Sean called the police again and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting myself into that situation, and I had just told them I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school, and I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so I didn't have money to buy weed, and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of his house, so I snuck on my phone and texted him that my parents might call his parents and he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said he wished he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to coke and I was selling my nudes. This is when the text started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I'd block that person's number. Then he'd use WhatsApp or GroupMe to text me since we use those for work, so I just block him on there. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went on for a few weeks, and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock, where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he wasn't in his car, so I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him, and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad, I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November, and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look in my rearview mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear, and she said, I didn't want to scare you, so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend to not notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message he had sent me over the months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive through talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by and I don't hear anything from him. I thought that maybe it was over and I could move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I stick to natural drugs. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continue to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean was not an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him
him was that he got arrested a few months ago. I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there, so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around town. I landed one from a girl that seemed just like a chill person. We had a few exchanges through the Tinder app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door and gave me a hug. She said the name of a local bar she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her I would drive and proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door. She had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me staring. I looked at her blankly for 15 seconds and asked her if she was going to get in. She said, sure, I would love to, and went the long way to the passenger's side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something, as I had kind of got the vibe she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I am not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back away from most people, just so I could have a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point and it was actually a fun time for the time being. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did, recreationally use weed, and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I am not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my mind to think maybe she was just high off marijuana, and that rationally explains some of the out of their behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point, so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks and she agreed. When we got to my place, we had a few more drinks, then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important, she said, I'm actually Anastasia, and I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that serious at this point with how much I drank, so I kind of challenged that statement using the little bit I knew about history. At this point, she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors in history. And then she got quiet and tiptoed right up to me and grabbed me by my neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says at this point, I am a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. And then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my face and kissed my forehead. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked to her into calming down, telling her I was only joking, then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she started talking about her cats. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I am not about judging people on their interests, so I listen in. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in my living room. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point, so I just listened to try not to set her off. She noticed sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual I like to do, but it's mine and mine alone. Something I take very personally and I like to do myself. I tell her no, she can't light it and that it's my thing to do on my own. Then she freaks out telling me I am a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her I can take her home now and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she is screaming at the top of her lungs that I am a horrible person and I should go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard and about 10 minutes saying she left her phone in there. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she is about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she is not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from. I told her no because I paid for the thing. I slam the door at that point and lock it. I hear her bang on the door for a minute. I then hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I I waited about an hour and then went walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. So a few months ago, I was out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of western Maryland and we were about 6 miles into an 8 mile loop we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button down shirt, not exactly hiking attire. We decided to set off on the last 2 mile leg of the loop. 
This park goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain slash bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail and you have to walk single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her and I see the same man right behind her, following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut-wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe, as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us, in case he is only following closely because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he is carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has sight lines to us, and he turns around looking up at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy, and we don't want to have to pass him again. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and see him walking up the trail too. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area we were at before. We start to strategize and wait, deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There are more people around, so we felt safe for waiting and out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We are talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or is waiting on the trail where it is more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between the slot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and says we need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there, he had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure we got to our car safely and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail but there was no sight of him. I wish I knew where he went and what happened to him but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The events of this story happened 13 years ago and it still messes with me to this day even though I'm not in any sort of danger. When I was in college, I got super depressed and stressed out near my junior year. I was always super into school and just started slipping near the end of my college term so it threw me off bad. Never experienced failing at subjects before and it threw me into a ridiculous stress. I graduated and figured everything would go away with that, but I found myself still very, very mentally foggy. My sister knew how bad off I was from the last few years of school so she hatched a plan to surprise me. I always wanted to go to Miami growing up. I know how lame that sounds, but being a girl who grew up in the Midwest and even went to college there, it was always super exciting looking to me. Up to this point I traveled but never went anywhere as lively or big as Miami always seemed. My sister planned a 5 night vacation with me as a way to get me out of this mental fog and also celebrate in our own way me graduating college. I was super excited. The few months passed and it was time for the trip. We get there and the first few nights were incredible. We hit up the restaurants I had on my little list of places to try and spend many hours by the ocean. I was never a big party girl. Up to this point in my life, I was drunk maybe twice. My sister was the opposite who was at every party that happened in our hometown. She got bored of going back to the room so early every night and convinced me to go to a nightclub with her for the first time. I fought it a bit but let my guard down because I was feeling great for the first time in a long time and was ready to try new things. It was a Saturday night downtown in the middle of summer. We get to this nightclub and the line is legit wrapped around the building. It was massive. We we waited in line for what felt like forever and were let in finally. I walked in the door and felt like I got shot because of the loudness. My sister dragged me to the bar and ordered some shots of some drink with a funny name. Again, I decided to just let my guard down and try new things. As more shots went down, I decided that would be the theme of the night, trying new stuff out. I was aware how boring I was and was, in my opinion, in the most exciting place in the world. Around 45 minutes into dancing and drinking, I became very drunk. 
borderline blackout. I was very sloppy drunk and was aware of it. I found myself laying on a couch thing in the upstairs area overlooking the dance floor as my sister was dancing with some guys. As I stayed there trying to consciously sober myself up, I realized how badly I had to pee. So I brought myself up to a sitting position on the couch to stand up and walk to the nearby bathroom. As I sat up, a massive man quickly sat so close to me I could feel his leather pants pressed on my leg. Absolutely over 6 feet tall and looked like some sort of bodybuilder. Admittedly, he was very good looking, but I was so drunk that I wasn't even trying to flirt and just get up to find the bathroom. He smiled at me and yelled over the music something like this, leaving so soon. I remember nervously laughing and attempted to get up but he grabbed onto my dress and pulled me back to a sitting position next to him. His smile went away and he said in a very deep tone, I don't remember telling you that you were allowed to leave. Even though I was very drunk leading up to this, I felt like I sobered up within seconds. I never had anything like this happen before, but I wasn't going to just allow this guy, no matter how much bigger than me he is, to do that to me. I attempted to stand up again and he did the exact same thing, but much more aggressive. I thought it was insanely rude, but I wasn't afraid because of how many people were around me. He tapped my heels with his big yellow leather boots and said, I couldn't help but notice how much I want to screw your feet. My fight or flight kicked in. I slapped him in the face and stood up to walk away. I was very uncomfortable, but I still wasn't afraid just because of the amount of people around. As I was walking away, I heard him laughing and he yelled to me, I'm trying to decide if I want to keep your feet after I cut the rest of your body up into little pieces. I walked away very quickly as I attempted to search for my sister on the dance floor from above. I couldn't find her, so I decided to take my phone out to text her just to see I had missed a call from her. I was out of eye shot from this dude and cut away into the bathroom so I could call her back. It was still pretty loud in there, but it wasn't loud enough to where she she couldn't hear me on the phone. I went into a stall and called her back. As I was in the stall, I heard the bathroom door open and someone went into the one directly next to me. I was waiting for her to pick up when I looked down underneath the stall and saw the same guy's very distinct yellow leather boots. He was just standing there. I felt like I was about to die. I knew he knew I was in there. I held my breath and hung up on the phone just staring at his shoes, not moving a single bit from when he shut the door. I heard the main bathroom door open again and I immediately ran out the stall, out the door and straight to outside the club without slowing down once. I was terrified. Just so happens my sister was close to where I came out trying to call me to ask if I was ready to leave. I told her we needed to get back as soon as possible. We got back to the room safely and I told her everything that happened. She suggested calling the police but I was just ready to drop it. We changed our flight and the next night flew back home. I searched for a few years pretty actively online for arrest in the area to see if he would ever come up. He never did. After a few years, I moved on mentally and got over it for the most part. I don't know who this guy was, if he was trying to say things to scare me, or if he was serious. This story begins when I was in 4th grade, so I was about 9, as I was a bit young for my grade. Because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't get along with them very well. So whenever we would go out to recess, I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day, I went over to my normal spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while but I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence so I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and something tugging on my hair. Surprised, I whipped my head around thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in the gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forward between the branches with his face mostly obscured by leaves and his arm outstretched, trying to grab Crap at my hair. I screamed and bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was very shy back then, so I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a friend who we'll call Matt. Matt was also a bit of an outcast, and when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became fast friends. He was nice enough, but even my nine-year-old self could tell that there was something off about him. He was way too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I of course didn't have any other friends then, so I ignored it. However, one day he told me that he liked me. 
I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as a yes because he called my home phone later that night. My mom handed me the phone saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now, this would be creepy for anyone, but I was 9. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He was not happy about this, constantly glaring at me and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through 5th grade and had a serious bully problem, but that's a story for another day. It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switch schools the following Monday. 5th grade at my new school was great, and starting in 6th grade, my parents got me my first phone. Of course, I called up Clara, who who became my friend after the Matt incident and let her know about my new phone. A couple more months passed and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey, I missed you so much. Why'd you leave me? Not even a second after he said that, I hung up, blocked his number, and called up Clara as she was the only person at my old school who had my number. Apparently, after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mom, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him as she was a very kind but quite gullible girl. Soon, she noticed that he was taking a while and that he had a pen out and was writing something on his arm. She yanked her phone away and he panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened up my contact info. I was freaked out but felt safe as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages every time. Every time I would block one number, he'd send a call from another one. When I got a new phone, the call stopped and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school, and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hairs, touching female students, and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room. The realization hit me like a semi-truck. Smelling and touching girls' hair. It was Matt from all of those years ago when I was reading at that tree. I'm a 24 year old woman and I once worked at a pharmacy store for about a year as a cashier. I had many weird encounters because people were sometimes behind in their medication doses when they came in to pick them up, mostly harmless. The shifts were usually just one cashier and a supervisor, with the supervisor in the back of the store and the cashier alone up front. This happened close to Halloween at about 9am on a sunny, innocent day. I was just chilling at the cash register waiting for customers when a man came in and stood in the aisle across from the register and just stared at me for a good five minutes. I didn't realize that's actually what he was doing until he made eye contact and he didn't look away. He was tall and reminded me of Tyler Labini's character in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, just not the least bit charming. I immediately called my supervisor up front over the loudspeaker and the guy walked down the aisle towards the pharmacy. When my supervisor appeared, I told her what happened. She downplayed it, didn't look for him, and said just to call her if he did anything. Comforting. When she was gone, the man made a loop around the store and came right to my register with a bag of Halloween candy and nothing else. I tried ringing him up quickly, but he started asking me ridiculous questions about our savings card program and insisting he sign up. I slid him a pamphlet to fill out his information because I did not want to speak to him more than I had to. He just stood there holding the pen and staring at me, then suddenly asked if I knew how trick-or-treating originated. I didn't have time to answer him before he started describing how, back in the day, the men that ruled the country would go house to house every year on Halloween and demand the daughters of every age to be handed over so they could, you know. That was trick-or-treating in his mind. As soon as I heard that, I said, get away from me, and walked to the other register and called my supervisor loudly over the speaker because he was blocking my way to the back. He didn't flinch as he followed me to the next register and started talking about how all women are bad and are meant to serve men. He noted my wedding ring and said my husband could also rent me out because it was his right end on and on. I was considering jumping the side of the register to put some distance between us so I could run. Luckily, the male pharmacist heard the panic in my voice and rushed over to the front of the store. He saw the man and shouted, Jake, get out of here. The man, Jake, just stared at him as he calmly walked out and it was so scary and stupid at the 
same time. Turns out that Jake had been a regular customer until he stopped picking up his medication. Instead, he would just come in and harass female workers and he'd been on a police enforced ban for over a year. My savior Mr. Pharmacist called the police and the store manager to cuss her out for still scheduling girls alone after everything Jake did in the past. Such as ripping a toilet seat off of one of our toilets and threatened to beat a girl with it who used to work there. I quickly transferred to a different location because I just could not get over it and the manager kept scheduling us alone. The police only watched the store for a week. I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that had stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm currently 20 years old. I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself and not a store inside it like me. I had one other friend at my job who was my age and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had and one day she asked if I heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange she didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling, or even someone to be afraid of, just as a very eccentric man. Jessica has also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day, chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior or harmless flirting. If he wasn't a 50-something year old man bringing chocolates to a 16 year old girl he barely knew, I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees and the restaurant was empty. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he had gray hair with bald patches and had beady little eyes which he never adverted from yours. Eric must have sneaked up on me as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy are you married? He almost laughed after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see my reaction. I began to clock onto the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be in interrupted by a shrill, but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite insert band here song? I felt creeped out. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was going through my Instagram page. I forced myself to forget all about it and carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable and he liked it when I got uncomfortable. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that Eric had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me and this manager informs me that a few years ago, Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl who used to work for our restaurant into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep yet still employed at the shopping center. On one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason, but on the other hand, I was frightened as he'd been doing this for years yet no one had stopped him. There was a woman who worked at the same place as me called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her text with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you sat on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here. I was stunned. I was constantly questioning why this old man was so bent on finding out everything I do in my life. He had gone out of his way to source information about me me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favorite film because it's a great film, right? Anyways, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. 
The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. This was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal and sent three pounds to it and quoted the movie Grease. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous and incessant calls, one after the other. My phone rang all night, I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, making Making a point to breathe heavy. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the links he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all of my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, hurting me or my family? I reported Eric to my managers and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior of times he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management yet nothing was done, except the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he outsmarted me and found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved city as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot about Eric. I was soon going to remember though. On Christmas day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed with a notification. I received a notification from PayPal and it was the exact amount of three pounds, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, sending on behalf of Eric. I had forgotten all about Eric and now he was antagonizing me through other people. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with my family until I forgot about the notification. I since haven't seen or heard anything from him and I wanted to stay that way. I'm not sure if he still works at the shopping center but I don't go there anymore so I don't have to find out. So this was back in 2011. There were four girls living in the house, including myself. Parents' place and I would sublet rooms. First girl was a child friend who moved in to get away from an abusive ex. Second girl applied via online ad and was normal enough except for telling everyone her daughter was actually her niece. Party girl. Third girl was a run-of-the-mill insurance claim processor and quiet type who kept to herself and usually declined any invitation from the rest of us when going out or socializing. Quiet girl. So party girl and I buy tickets to go to a concert at a town. Childhood friend can't get the time off of work and opts to stay behind as does Quiet Girl. No surprise there. So Party Girl and I leave on our trip and spend the night dancing away. Meanwhile, childhood friend comes home from work to find Quiet Girl sitting in the shower screaming slash crying with the bathroom door wide open. She asks if she's okay and calms her down. Quiet Girl says she wanted to make dinner for all of us and Party Girl and I have ruined her cosmic plans. Childhood friend sees spoiled chicken breasts in the sink and thinks, oh she just wanted to do something nice and offers to go out to dinner together as party girl and I will be back tomorrow night and we can all do dinner then. While at the all-you-can-eat Chinese food restaurant, childhood friend notices quiet girl is stuffing her purse with food. This is odd. She's not wrapping it in napkins, just shoving it in there. When they get home, quiet girl started talking all this crazy stuff that made no sense and childhood friend gets a little nervous and goes to bed early, locks herself in her room and nopes out for the night. When party girl and I get home the next afternoon, we notice a few things. Childhood friend is already at work, but quiet girl is sitting on the living room couch completely naked and has covered her body in the stuffed animals that belong to the rest of us. Rotten chicken is still in the sink and smells strongly of bleach and other chemicals. Knives are laying around and pictures have been removed from the walls. I go to my room and see all the pictures of my dad have been piled up in the middle of my bed. I ask Quiet Girl about this and she explains I need to be reunited with my father. He died in 2003. Party Girl emerges from her room wondering why her underwear is piled up in the middle of her bed and several other possessions have gone missing. Quiet Girl says she needed them for the ritual and explains we can find what we are looking for in the backyard. We find the charred remains of our things in the smoldering fire pit. We are both angry at this point and demand she explain this behavior. This is where she goes full crazy and explains that her souls are all linked and only through death can our bonds be truly realized. She explains that her and my cat are one soul and that he has been telling her about all of our sins and bad behavior. Also that it's actually her cat. She then full on threatens to end our lives as soon as the last member, childhood friend, has 
has arrived. I grab the largest knife I own while party girl and I barricade ourselves in my room in the basement. She calls childhood friend telling her not to come home as it isn't safe and I call 911 as my life has been officially threatened by someone who has clearly lost her grip on all reality. Cops arrive within minutes and ask quiet girl her name. At this point she just starts screaming her first, middle, and last name repeatedly, over and over again, will not stop. My cat is trying to sneak out the front door and I ask one of the officers to grab him. She begins to scream that it is her cat and not to touch him. I am in tears and offer to retrieve his adoption papers. I am terrified and don't know what to do. Party girl is hiding behind me. Then quiet girl loses her mind, jumps up and attacks the officers. It took three of them to pin her down and arrest her. Once she was removed, I wrote up a letter of eviction and we began bagging up her room. That's when we discovered that she was a schizophrenic who was offered schizophrenia medication. Her boyfriend came later that day to collect her things as I had called him to notify him of the situation and he was totally clueless. He accused the rest of us of running a drug ring party house and driving her insane. Not true at all. We changed the front and the back door locks that night and put new locks on each bedroom door as well. She later tried to serve me papers and sue me for wrongful imprisonment. Pretty sure the cops made that call, not me. Nothing ever came of it obviously. I have not had a roommate I wasn't related to since. This happened about two years ago when I was 22. After work, I stopped at a local convenience store to buy beer. The cashier looked familiar, but it's a very small town, population of 6,000. He acted odd. I asked how he was doing to make small talk and he just stared at me. I instantly felt uncomfortable, so I only glanced at him a few times before I left. I arrived home 10 minutes later and decided to browse Facebook. I had a friend request. The guy looked familiar. He was a local, so I accepted him. A few hours later, I realized it was the cashier. He got my name off of my ID and added me not even five minutes after I left. I told my boyfriend we agreed it was weird. A few days later he came into my work. I asked my boss. She'd never seen him in there before. He grabbed milk and initiated small talk with me. I felt uncomfortable. He asked if I remembered him, told me his name, and that we'd been good friends in high school. We never said two words to each other. I was trying to be polite, told him yes, I remembered. After a few minutes, my boss pulled me in the office. She was watching through the window and could tell I was uncomfortable. It was a small farm pharmacy and we were all close. He started coming in every few days. If I wasn't there he'd ask for me. After a few weeks, my boss would pull me in the office whenever he'd walk in. All the managers were briefed and did the same. That was all they could do until something happened. Then he stopped coming in. We didn't see him for a few weeks. I was relieved and went about my business. I was allowed to carry my cell phone on the floor. My mom was very sick so if she needed anything, the managers were fine with her calling me. I got a text from a random number shortly after. I asked who it was and they replied, you don't remember? You gave me this number. It's my stalker. I'll call him George. My heart started pounding. I sent a polite, short message back. After I work, I checked to see if my phone number was anywhere on my Facebook. It wasn't. George started messaging me daily, calling me babe. I was freaked out to say the least. My boyfriend was working out of town with limited cell reception, so I couldn't let him know what was going on. A few days later, I got a message from an old classmate I still talk to once in a while. Hey, did George ever get a hold of you? He said there was an emergency and needed to contact you. Is everything alright? I broke down crying, finally acknowledging that yes, I was being stalked. I didn't know if he was violent and he knew where I worked, so I sent him something like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I have a boyfriend. I didn't want there to be a misunderstanding between us. That's when it got bad. He called me a liar, telling me he doesn't know why my ugly self would even think he was interested in me. No man would be interested in your nasty self. I asked him to leave me alone. The insults got worse. I shut my phone off and tried to ignore him. A few hours later, after calming down, I turned it back on. The last message he sent read, I know where you work. I know where your house is. I could kill you in your house. Try to call the cops on me. I'm in New York right now. Do it. They can't protect you. Obviously not as legible. I could tell he was mad and wrote it in haste. I called a friend and explained. Show showed her the text. She took me down to the police station where I showed them the text. I filed a report and later got a restraining order against him. Turns out he already had two other restraining orders from girls he'd done this to as well. My boyfriend came back a week later and I told him what happened and had to stop him from hunting him down. Last year, he tried getting my number from a friend over Facebook. She blocked him. I haven't seen or heard from him since, thankfully. There have been very few times in my life I've been that scared.
For some context, I'm a 32 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside, or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said sure. He initiated simple conversation to which I obliged, but being careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which department building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person in my life. But I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had nearly spent all of my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere, seemingly out of nowhere. The same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and I would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets, with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me. But keep a few faces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim. But he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speed walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked. The moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it, to look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me. It was him. I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student, whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me. I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road to, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I was shook. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a co-worker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked and even though I'm terribly shy, I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding and I was shaking. I don't even remember
remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work and from then on was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been 5 or 6 years since then now and I still work at the university. I am so relieved to say that I never saw him again after the food court and haven't had any other heroin accounts on campus. I never asked the guy's name so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. When I was in my early 20s, I moved to Southern California with my aunt. Once I had a job established and steady income, I found an apartment that was super affordable at $350 a month, plus utilities, the first red flag because California is not cheap. The other residents in the apartment was a 45 year old male named Zach and a 45 year old female named Tina. They weren't a couple. Tina was a little difficult to deal with, very OCD on a lot of things and we mostly avoided each other. But this story is about Zach and his friend Mike, also 45 years old. Mike and Zach were childhood friends and Mike lived in the same apartment complex as us. So he was over a lot. Every time I would come home from work, they would be polishing off a handle of vodka and then would go out. I wasn't super comfortable in the living situation but it was cheap. and. I was in school, and I tried to make the best of it. I got along with Zach for the most part if it was just him around, but Mike was just a time bomb. Here are just a few instances that just gradually got worse over time. The first incident. Zach invited me out with Mike and another friend of theirs out to a local bar a couple miles away. I was comfortable around Zach and I got into the passenger side of the truck. I didn't have any negative interactions with anyone until this point. Mike went ballistic in our complex parking lot about how I was selfish and had no business in the front seat because I wasn't Zach's girlfriend etc. It was weird because a man the same age as my dad was throwing a tantrum over the passenger seat, so I just got out and went back to my apartment. My first rent check bounced. I apologized to Zach and discovered that my checks had misprinted the account number. I paid in cash and paid off the bounce check fee and thought all was okay, until I got home one evening and Mike was over as normal, but starts interrogating me on why I couldn't pay my rent. I was only 22 at the time and didn't really want issues, so I was just like, hey, I apologized and took care of it. Even though Mike didn't live in the apartment. He would not let this go. He would just scream at me saying I was lazy, that I should be evicted and on and on. It's also important to note that Mike and Zach both had two DUIs. Zach was a school teacher and ended up being let go because of the DUIs. However, both men continued to drink excessively all the time. I also had to have a key made for the lock on my bedroom door because it would get violent a lot and that was my safety net. A lot of other instances happened, but this one takes the cake and is the point to the story. Zach and Mike had gone out and took an Uber to whatever local bar. I had gotten home and went straight to my room as always. I hear the front door swing open and Mike was pissed drunk screaming his head off about how he lost his new iPhone. This guy starts beating on my bedroom door demanding to be let in because he knew I had his phone. I cracked my door open and he had stepped away from the door with his fist balled up like he was going to hit me. I told him I didn't have the phone. Mike circles back to the one time months prior at this point that my rent check bounced and I obviously need money. He demands that he come into my room and tear my room apart looking for said phone. I told him absolutely not and shut slash locked the door. Mike started banging on my door and trying to unlock it, threatening my life, saying he was going to kill me and lots of other gross and scary things. I was told if I called the police that he would beat me to a bloody pulp. This was especially scary because my aunt was my only family nearby and she wasn't really helpful. She just told me to be an adult and deal with it. Other than that, I didn't really have a support system. I told Zach a couple of days later that I would be moving out immediately and would not be paying rent for that month. Then out of Zach's dark bedroom, Mike just pops up with a smile saying bye, almost taunting. I hurried into my room and locked the door. I could hear Zach blaming Mike for me moving out and Mike continued to just call me names and asking how I had the money to move out. The iPhone was found for anyone who's curious. It had fallen out of his pocket in the Uber he was in, but obviously the first step to finding the iPhone was to flip out on me versus calling the Uber driver. This was almost a decade ago and I don't know what happened to that pair. About two years ago, I worked at a movie store inside a mall. I was 20 at the time. This guy was over 6 foot, late 40s, very hefty, and always had this weird zombified expression on his face. He came in about once a week. One of my coworkers had even warned me about him, how he was a little off, but I still treated him with as much respect as I did everyone else. One day, he came in and we talked for a bit, but it got a little awkward and I kept trying to end the conversation and looked busy by tagging items behind the counter. He stood there in silence 
watching me for about 20 minutes and finally left. A few days later, he comes back in and walks up to me, holding a large container. He says, I made four pounds of enchiladas at home today, just for you. I remembered you like Mexican food. I don't remember at all telling him that I liked it, but I do know that I went to the Mexican restaurant across the way every lunch break. I just politely accepted it and put it in the back office. Another few days later, he came back in and had a drawing for me of a dragon. Now, I love dragons, but I never told him that. This drawing looked like it took hours to make, and at this point, I was a little freaked out. I had him leave it on the counter so I could just throw it away later. Later on, I was given about a week vacation. During that week, I had cut my hair about 12 inches. The day I came back, I got a shift with my manager. I told her all about the guy, and immediately she was weirded out for me. A few minutes later, I see the dude walking around in the mall. He was going towards the exit and didn't look at me once. My manager tells me to go back to the office. I go and wait until she comes to get to me, and when she does, she tells me I need to make a report to mall security immediately. Apparently, when I ran back there, he turned around to come in and walked all throughout the store. When she asked him if he needed help with something, he said, I can't believe she cut her hair, and briskly walked out. I go to the mall security office to make a report, and we went through all the videos from the cameras of when the guy came to visit me, but there was one video that really stood out. The video shows him pull into the parking lot of the mall, and about three minutes later, I arrive. This was really early in the morning and no customers were here yet, but there were cars in the lot. I didn't notice him at all. It shows me walking through the entrance and him following me. Right as I open the entrance door, the man starts sprinting towards me. I walked inside just in time. It shows him stop and just stand in front of the door, watching me through the glass walk a little further away. He begins walking normally inside the mall. I never noticed him behind me. That part really screwed me up. The video gave the security every reason to ban him from the mall and they did. They later told me they gave him a background check and he had four counts of stalking with restraining orders from different girls on his person and was on probation. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.